<laughs> okay, uh, welcome to a special edition of Tech Time. It's the wrong week and it's 2 p.m. and we have a special guest. Yay! So, uh, Fabio over there, he'll be our second speaker talking about FS2, is that right? Um, but first, I'm going to talk about uh, Shapeless. So, I'll give an introduction to what Shapeless is and what it does, um, and then I'll talk about a slightly more advanced <coughs> use case that I, I had the other day. So, this is all about massaging case classes, by which I mean taking data from one case class into a similar, or another case class that's either exactly the same or quite similar in shape, um, but maybe doing some transformations along the way. Um, so we're going to look at HList first, which is like one of the fundamental building blocks of Shapeless. If you're going to do anything with Shapeless, you need to understand HList. Um, then we'll look at generic and labeled generic. Uh, then I'll talk about some more complicated things that I did the other day with Shapeless. Um, and then finally, we're going to look at this library called Chimney, which I discovered recently, which is, um, well, I'll talk about it later. OK, so this is a list. Does everyone understand this slide? <laughs> um, it is a value which is made up of smaller values. So the values 1, 2, and 3 are made up into a list value. And equivalently, the type is made up of the type of the things in the list. So it contains int, so it is a list of int. Uh, an H list, on the other hand, um, it can contain more than one type of things. The H stands for heterogeneous, meaning it can contain different types of things. And the type of the H list is made up of the types of each of the things in the list. Um, so this one, it has the type on the top, string, int, boolean, h nil, and then it has the values underneath. So it's got a string in it, it's got an int in it, it's got a boolean in it, so that's why the type is string, int, boolean. Um, so using H lists, you can do things like uh, generic, where you take a case class. Uh, in this case, we have our domain model class. It's got a string, a int, and a boolean. You convert it into uh, this generic representation, which is an H list. So you've stripped away the fact that it's a case class and it's called domain model. You don't care about that. All you care about is the string, the int, and the boolean. And then you could take that and you can convert it into another case class with a different name, say API representation. And it's even got different names for the fields, but we don't care. As long as it's got a string and an int and a boolean in the right order, then we can convert between these by going through this generic representation, which is the hlist. Uh, so to do that in shapeless, it looks a bit like this. You import shapeless.underscore. Uh, you have an instance of your domain model case class that you want to convert. Uh, you summon an instance of the generic type class for, for domain model. That's what we're doing here. Generic of domain model. And then on that type class instance, you can call this to method. You pass in your case class instance, and it gives you back the generic representation, which is the H list. And then once you've got to your H list, you can go back the other way. So you summon the generic for API representation. You call from, and you pass the H list in, and it gives you back a case class. So that's just doing this transformation here in, in code. OK, so generic is one of the the most simple things you can do in uh, Shapeless, but there's a variant of it called labeled generic. So what the difference is, that, is that now we care about what the field names are. So instead of them just being a string, an int, and a boolean, we now care that they're called A, B, and C. So we record that information. Um, so that means that, in this case, we can no longer convert between API representation and this generic representation because the class, the field names don't match anymore. Um, 
So depending on your use case, this can be more useful than generic. And this, um, the way this is represented, represented in Shapeless, I've written it using this kind of weird arrow syntax. We've got an A mapping to year and a B mapping to one, two, three. Um, it's, rep it's represented as an H list, just like before. But now, if we have a look at it, we can see the types have gone crazy. So we start at the bottom. The actual values are still the same. We've got the the year and the one, two, three down here. So it's still an H list and it's still got the same values in it, but the types are really complicated. So this is the first element here, this is the string. And it, we can see that it's a tagged type. So it's, it's a string, it's a string type, but it's been tagged with this so-called key tag, which has the actual name of the field here. So this is a singleton type of the of this A string here. Uh, and equivalently, or similarly, we've got an int for the next one. So it's an int, but it's been tagged with a special key tag thing, and that records the fact that it's called P, the field name is P. So you manage to preserve this information about the field names in the types. <coughs> Okay, so that was pretty simple. We were going from a case class with three fields to another case class with three fields. Um, we didn't have to do anything too special, but we managed to remove some boilerplate by going by using label generic. We didn't have to write out like this dot a equals that dot a, this dot b equals that dot b. So that's quite useful, but sometimes you need to do some more complicated transformations. So we'll look at a couple of those. Uh, the first is sometimes you need to remove a field. Say uh, you've got your domain model internally, which has lots of fields, but maybe you don't want to expose all of them on your API representation, so you might want to remove some of them. Um, and Shapeless can help you do that. So at the top, we've got this case class with five fields, A, B, C, D, E. Uh, at the bottom, we've got a case class with only four fields, but we don't care about the D field. we get rid of that. So we can do that by turning it into an H list using label generic and then removing the D. Um, we do that using uh, so-called record syntax in Shapeless. So we've got our case class at the top. Uh, we turn it into an H list using label generic. <coughs> and then we import the special record syntax. And that means that we can now do things like minus D just to remove the D field. Um, so that's how you remove a field. And if, if you wanted to go back the other way, you can use slightly different syntax to add new fields in as well. So if you wanted to go from our four fields case class back up to our five fields case class, we could do that <coughs> as well. <coughs> OK. so. Uh, what if your types don't exactly match? You've got case classes that are similar, but not quite the same. So this is the thing that I encountered the other day that I, I used Shapeless for. Uh, so we've got our domain model, which has an A, B, and a C, string, int, and a boolean, and they are all there. We know they are present, so they are not options. But then the API representation that we want to expose uh, has some of them as optional fields. They are options. So we need to turn it into an H list and then somehow kind of work through that H list and add, turn them into options where necessary, and then we can turn them from an H list into the API list. So um, so what we need to do for each field kind of depends on the input type and the output type. So in the case of the first field, string, it's going to a, a string, so we don't need to do anything. But then the second field is going from int to optional int, so we need to wrap it in a sum to make the types line up correctly. And the same for the third field. Um, and the way that we can do this kind of looking at the input type and the output type and deciding what to do in each case uh, in the shapeless, that's called a polymorphic function. 
So we can write a function like this that has different cases based on the input and output types. Um, so I called it wrap with option if necessary. And it extends this poly1, this polymorphic function type. And it's got two cases. You can kind of think of it like pattern matching on the input and output types that you, you're interested in. So in this case, you've got the case, the, the pattern match case where the input type is equal to the output type. And then the other case that we care about uh, is where you have a field with key K. So this is the name of the field, like A, B, C, and some value type V, like string or int or whatever. And you want to turn that into a field with the same name, K, and an option of string or option of int or whatever. So this is the other case that we care about. Um, and the implementation in that case, we take the value and we wrap it in a sum. <clears throat> so that's doing these two cases here that we care about. String to string and int to option int. Um, so we're going to, how do we actually use this polymorphic function and apply it to an H list? We're going to use it via this new trait that I've defined called massage. So what this does is to massage an H list of type from, which might be like string int boolean h nil, to into an H list of type two. Uh, it's going to use that um, this polymorphic function that we just defined. Uh, to convert the elements as it goes through the H list. Uh, and it's got this apply function, so you can pass in an instance of the H list, the incoming H list, and it will give you back uh, an H list of the appropriate type. Um, and how are we going to actually build up, how are we going to build this trait? Uh, we're going to use uh, induction to build it. So it's kind of like inductive proofs. If you think back to doing maths in school, you, um, you probably had learned about how to do inductive proofs. So if you can prove the base case, like this proposition is true for zero or one or whatever, and you can prove the inductive step saying, if it's true for n, then it's true for n plus one, then you've proved it for all numbers, all natural numbers. And the way that we uh, define this massage trait uh, we're going to be using implicits in Scala, but it, you can think of it as like this kind of inductive proof. We're going to be doing inductive implicits. So we'll need an implicit for the base case, and then an implicit for the inductive step. So our base case is H nil, the empty list. And that's just trivial, because you can always take an, an H nil and just give back the same H nil. There's nothing to do. And then our inductive step is going to be if there is a massage instance for the tail of the list, and we know how to convert the head of the list using that polymorphic function, then we can give you back a massage instance for the head and the tail combined. So that's our inductive step. And if we've got both of those two, then we've proved that we can generate a massage instance for the whole of the list. Right, time to implement it. <clears throat> okay, so there is my polymorphic function, just the same as I showed you on the slide. And there is my trait. Massage. So we need to implement the H nil and the <laughs> inductive step. I'm going to live code with shapeless. We'll see how this goes. So the H nil will have an implicit vowel massage H nil. 
and that will be a map search of from h nil to h nil. And we just give back the same H nil that we were given. That was easy. Oops, I've got a typo. Um, but the poly, the inductive step is slightly more complicated. So we're going to have a bunch of type parameters. So we'll have the from head, oh, that's annoying. I'm all on one line. The from head, the to head, the from tail, which will be an H list, and the to tail is an H list. And we will need some implicit evidence of the things that we are assuming for our um, inductive step to work. So we assume that we know how to massage the remainder of the list. So we have a massage of uh, from tail to to tail. <coughs> and we know that we can convert the head of the list, or we are assuming that we are able to convert the head of the list from a um, I need to look up what this is. Sorry. Don't look at the answer. Right, we need one of those. So this is saying that we know how to use that wrapped with option if necessary polymorphic function to convert from the from head type to the to head type. Uh, and this thing is going to give back a massage from type from head on onto from tail to to head on onto to tail. So the apply method for this massage thing, uh, it will take in a from would have taken uh, okay so it'll take in the whole list the head and the tail it'll give back the new head and new tail We'll do so by uh, calling the convert head function using the polymorphic function to convert the head, and then consing that onto massaging the remainder and giving it the tail. So it's recursively calling itself in uh, calling this other massage method that was passed in um, so it's, that's why it's using the inductive assumptions I think that's right just double check yeah that looks reasonable
that compile. Wow, it compiles. Uh, so then just to, on top of all of that stuff, I just wrote a very tiny DSL so that uh, you can, uh, given an instance of your domain model, and pass it into this, this method called massage. You can massage my domain model to API representation type. And then just because of the way type inference works, you have to be quite polite and you have to say please at the end. So if we run this, oops. Then, uh, sorry, is it a bit low down? Then uh, you can see that it has massaged the main model into an API representation by wrapping things in options. <coughs> okay, so that's how you do it in Shapeless, and it is reasonably complicated, but after I'd written all of that, I discovered this new library called Chimney, which makes it a lot easier. Um, this thing basically, it does a similar thing to what I did, but it's wrapped it up into a nice library. So it's like a, a nice DSL sitting on top of Shapeless to do this kind of transformation, adding fields, removing fields, uh, transforming types, and so on. So I recommend it. Um, and just for completeness, I went through the same exercise and using Julie. So all you need to do is you uh, instead of using a polymorphic function, they use this thing they've named called transformer. So you provide an implicit transformer to say, given any A, this is how you wrap it in an option. So go from an A to an option of A. Um, and then you do domain model dot into the representation class dot transform. And it does the same thing, so it'll give you back an uh, instance of your API representation with, with these fields wrapped up in options. Um, that's it. So the slides are here. The code is on GitHub. If you want to learn more about Shapeless, then this book is excellent, and that library is here as well. Thank you. Uh, it's probably worth mentioning there's another library which uh, through the books uh, called uh, Scala Ultimate Representative. I'm just checking out this one. For the sake of the video, Scala Automapper does a similar thing. <laughs> okay, uh, on to our next talk. Just give us a few minutes to set up. Cool. Okay. Sorry about all that. All that set up. Um, so before we start, I actually got two questions. First, no one told me how much time I have for this. So how much time do I have for this? Half an hour? Forty-five minutes? Half an hour? Whatever. Um, so much I want to ask: How many people here can say they're familiar with the difference between effects and side effects, or alternatively between standard Scala future and Cat's effect IO? Not a lot. Uh, Okay, so a good amount of people are not, so I've got a section for that. I was you know, trying to decide whether I should do it or not, and I'll do it. Okay, um, so this talks about FS2, uh, and FS2 is a purely functional uh, streaming IO library. Uh, but what the talk is really about, like in, you know, actually, is about control flow. So a way of achieving declarative uh, control flow. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Fabio. Um, I'm a you know, software engineer in the financial industry, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but more importantly, I do a bunch of open source stuff. I'm one of the core contributors and maintainers of FS2. I'm a maintainer for Cat's Effect, uh, HTTP4S, and I contribute to Shapeless Cats and all, and all that stuff. Um, so let's get straight into it. Uh, so I said pure FP. So what is pure functional programming? What, like, why do we care? So we start from this very, very simple um, definition, which says, you can always replace an expression for its bound value without changing the result. And it seems weird, but this is exactly what you've been doing all of your life if you've done math up until I don't know, middle, like, you know, grade six or seven. Uh, 
So basically, if I tell you uh, x plus 2 uh, minus x plus 3, and I tell you that x is 5, what do you do? You put 5 everywhere you see x, just blindly, and then you reduce things using you know, the rules that you know. Uh, and that's, that's what we're doing here, right? So all pure is saying is that we want to be able to do the same with our code. And we will see examples, and we will see why should you care about this property. It's a very, very important property, even though most people never heard of it, um, it until they get into FP. Oops. Um, so let's start with this very simple example. I've got a string that I'm reversing, a logo reverse, and then I am appending the, the result, and you see ole ole as, as the result. So the way you use to think about this imperative is like a sequence of steps, right? That's how you evaluate code in your mind. But let's try instead of switching our mental model to this you know, substitution thing that I just mentioned. This is called a substitution model, by the way. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put um, y every time, sorry, I'm going to put a load of reverse every time it's x. Just see what we do with, with x equals 5, right? Uh, and we see that uh, doing that produces the same result. Holy holy. So this code has the property that applying the substitution model does not change the result. And this is called pure. This is pure code. So this is what we mean by pure code. Pure code is code that respects this property. So let's look at another example instead. So again, I've got an int. Uh, this time I'm reading from some int and then some. So again, rather than try and switch off your, like, possibly imperative, I'm going to see. Uh, try to switch off your uh, university uh, C brain uh, and let's instead uh, discuss in terms of the substitution model. So if I do this, obviously that in this red is 2. And then if I do 2 plus 2 is 4. And I'm going to blindly substitute and let the standard read it every time it's again because it's like the substitution model says. But what happens now is that you've got read in and read in, which is different. Now you read it from the input twice and you get a different result. So this code is called not pure. So this is what we say uh, as side effects. But we, I haven't told you what side effect is yet. So the side effect of, of this, you know. It's because of, of this point. So let's let's go into that. Well, another another example. This time is, is with future. So I think everyone is familiar with future. Uh, so again, bar read is a future of start that read in. Uh, and then I'm just saying read read. And my pen is a cat syntax. It's equivalent to a four comprehension, basically, if you have a common process. But basically, if I do four, read, read, and then in and so on. And then same result, right? Because the the end is read once, and when you go to the other reads, the, the two is already there, the future is already completed. So you get the same two, so you get four. Now we substitute using the same thing. And now things have changed, because we've got two futures, and now they're going to read from the standard input twice. So this does not respect the substitution model, and therefore this is not pure. And now most people think that reading from the standard input is not pure, right? But then, how do we do purely functional programming? So if this is a side effect, and purely functional programming has no side effects, do we not read from this? How do we get anything done? So, and this is like, oh no, but you've got a pure subset, and then you've got the impure, no, it's like, this, is all, this is all wrong. And the catch is the definition of side effect. We will see now, because we're going to use another thing that looks like future, it's called AO from Cat's Effect. It looks like future in that it's an F of A, you know, future of A, AO of A. It's got a flat map, like, you know, mono distance, applicative, so it looks, looks very similar, but it's got a crucial difference in behavior. So I've got um, the same code, but what happens now is that I'm reading things twice. And the reason is that, so first of all, when I say val read, read int, nothing has happened. Whereas with future, future starts its evaluation immediately in a negative fashion, with IO, it just wraps this, this side effect of this, you know, this thing of reading an int. And you can think of it as like a rest before reading an int, or like you know, a computation that we're reading it. And when I combine this computation, I get another computation that, that, that will be the same. Actually, the, the reason I say when you run it is because if you return this on a, on a REPL, nothing will happen. It will just return this IO. So you need to explicitly say run the IO to make things up. <coughs> but the thing is, you never run the IO, you just compose it with other IOs until you've got this massive IO at the end of the program, and then you run that. And when you run that, then when actual side effects are happening, but since it's the last thing in your code chain, nothing can observe it. So everything else below is referential to a spread. It respects the substitution model property. 
And again, I can prove to you by replacing, and we get the same result. And I and like I did this all, uh, you know, already. And once someone told me, I'll, I'll, like, what if I want to read once? Then you just like read once and then map, and then you say X. So in case you were not confused. Uh, but the important thing is that they, these two behave the same. Substituting an expression for its bound value does not change the result. And this is pure. So we've done purely functional I.O. The thing that seems like nonsensical is because people misunderstand what purity inside effects mean. Uh, this, is, this is pure. Uh, it respects the property. So what is pure FP? Uh, so side effects are things that break referential transparency. I haven't said anything about reading from this, commutating files, or mutating states. Definition of a side effect is breaking this property. Now, things like I.O., state, and so on, are traditionally side effects. So if you use Java, or you use sort of standard library Scala or Future, these things are done in a way that breaks this property. But they don't have to be, right? So, um, um, sorry, just for later. So I.O., case effect I.O., allows you to do all these things in a way that respects this property. Now the question is, why should I care about this? Uh, why should I care about this? This is a property that seems like fairly academic. Does he have any impact on, on, on my code? This is probably the problem, in my opinion, obviously, is the problem that has the greatest impact on, on your code. Um, among, you know, and even like before, um, you know, type safety or whatever, this is super, super important. Um, and why is it important? So everyone likes to think of beautiful code as kind of Lego bricks. And the beautiful thing about Lego bricks is that to understand a complicated thing, if they split into separate parts, understand the parts in isolation, and then put them back together, such that the behavior of the sum is exactly the sum of the behavior. There's no either interaction. And conversely, when you're building code, you want to build these little blocks, and then just put them back together with the same property. So referential transparency is like the essence of being a Lego brick. And the reason is, the fact that you can replace an expression with its value everywhere, it means that there's no context carried around. It doesn't matter what happened before, what happened after. It's just a single thing. It's a value, just like one is a value. Whereas reading is not a value because it's got this other thing, you know, when you change it, things change. So it depends on when you're changing it, if you change it, it's got this context. Uh, whereas, you know, this doesn't carry context. It doesn't care about context. Everything it does, it's in its input, and sorry, everything it cares is in its input, and everything it does is in its output. That means that we can use local reasoning only to reason about our code. When I say x plus 3 plus x plus 5, I can think about x plus 3 as its own thing. And solve it, even if it's super complicated, and then replace it back in. But imagine if replacing that didn't work and things had, had changed. Now you cannot do that. Now you need to read the whole expression into one. And this is what happens with our code. When we introduce side effects, we lose the ability to split things. Because replacing that back in might change the behavior. Whereas with this, we don't. We preserve local reasoning. And local reasoning is awesome because we can you know, compose things and we can decompose things in a nice way. So the way I like to describe this, if you have the feeling in your head of having too many things at once, and like, oh no, I hope no one sends me an email right now, otherwise I'm gonna lose it, this does not happen. Because you've got these splittable things and you can put them back together uh, in a compositional manner. So cat's effect uh, exposes this type called IOA. It also exposes other stuff like type classes, but let's just focus on, on IOA. Um, IOA is a computation that will produce one value, or fail, or never terminate. And when I say this, just imagine always when run, and then it's run at the end of the world. I cannot say it every single time, otherwise this is after talk. Uh, but this is like the mental model for it. It's like produce one, one thing, or will fail, or will never terminate. Uh, and it's referentially transparent, it's pure, that's the thing, that's why you should use it. Oh, and by the way, it's also like five times faster than future. Uh, if not, someone is not convinced by FD. Uh, but, you know, it is pure. Uh, and it's compositional because, because of purity. Uh, and the way you operate this is through its algebra. So the fact that it's a monad and a plicative, a functor, and what have you. Now, Let's talk about sort of data processing with I.O. very quickly, because I obviously I'm, I'm doing a total force of, of all this. But basically, let's say I've got this very simple um, list processing algorithm. Uh, I'm just going to sort of remove the empty lines of comments and then convert everything to other case and then take the first time uh, in that list. But I need to read this list from a file. And I want to keep the set properties that make this thing nice is that it's compositional and you can, you can like see this composition because every line makes sense on its 
sorry for the guys uh, that like relying on the microphone. Uh, every line makes sense of its own, uh, and you know you can split them and you can combine them, and, and, and it's nice. And when I read from a file, I want to have the same property of you know, not ruining or not ruining this nice thing. And that means that to read from a file, I need to use I/O. So I'm going to return an I/O list of string, and I'm going to wrap that read list from file. Imagine that's a Java or impure Scala function into I/O, and then I'm going to map. And map on I/O just you know I gets access to the value when run or whatever, and then process. And this is great. Uh, you know you can do this. Um, the problem with this though is not in its you know compositionality properties, but in the fact that now you need to have all the list in memory, right? When you read, you only produce an I/O list of string, then then it gets fed to the next function, and that means that you need the whole list in memory. So what if your list does not fit into memory? Well, it turns out you need to go back to Sort of purely functional imperative code. So it's purely functional because it's in IO, but it's fairly imperative because you need like a chunk at the time and you've got these four comprehensions that look like while loops, they like, you know, they take recursive functions, but morally it's the same, the same loop. So we've lost this nice math filter, high level, high level view of, of, of our code with when, when effects come into place. And we don't want that. We want to, you know, have our cake and, and eat it too. So let's introduce FS2 instead. Um, so the main abstraction of FS2 is a thing called stream. And stream has got this shape. So it's got two type parameters, F and A. Let's start with A. So a stream, as just as IO is a thing that can produce one value, a stream is instead something that can emit zero or two n values of type A. And then can be infinite. And infinite streams are perfectly normal and actually very useful. So this is not a corner case. It's, it's an important thing. And you know, zero values as well. This is also an important thing. Uh, while emitting these values, it can request effects in F. Now, by, what I mean by this is like, imagine that you need to emit five strings when you're reading them from the standard input. That's what I mean by requesting effect in F. And you, for, for this talk, we're going to assume that F is always I.O. For other cases, so do you, if you're familiar with the user's connection I.O., you can have a stream of connection I.O., you cannot have a stream of future because we require the F to be, to be pure and there's type class and cat's effect like sync, that only evidence is for pure, for pure stuff. So you cannot have a stream of future. And now let's look at an example of streaming I.O. So you, I don't think you need to know FS2 well to understand what this does. So I've got a simple function that converts Fahrenheit to Celsius. I'm going to read the file. Uh, I'm going to do this, like decode UTF, make sure the text is understood as UTF. And I split by line. I'm going to, again, remove comments and lines. I'm going to do the conversion with map, just fit the map, which is like the list. We're going to have new lines at the end of each number. We're going to code it back as text, and I'm going to write it to a file. Now, this looks exactly like, like normal code, right? Read all, just read the whole file, and then does stuff on it. But what's actually happening, this is streaming. So since FS2 can emit things, it's going to emit a chunk at a time. See that uh, 4,000 thing is the chunk size? And then each chunk gets processed. So this executes in constant memory. Even if your file is 40 gig, it will do things one at a time. So we have streaming I.O. We have streaming uh, and we have effects. And FS2 is super cool for that. Uh, you know, if you have streaming needs, uh, I think company like you probably has streams for quite a lot of things, that's cool. But conversely, if you don't have streaming needs, you might think that's, that, that streams are not useful for you when FS2 is useful for you. Um, actually, what I want to talk about today is, uh, is discuss a bit of uh, stream for control flow instead. So why stream nice, even if I didn't need stream uh, as an abstraction? So control flow. Um, and again, the property is that I want to express is like this high level math filterishness of like, you know, very high level uh, whole meal programming on the whole thing rather than, you know, wilds or four comprehensions or uh, you know, recursive functions, which we still use, right? But, you know, I, I think you, you get what I mean once I start giving examples. So let's first uh, discuss very quickly how to produce streams. So there's actually several methods, uh, like many more, but this, this one, like primitives, this is a random combinator that I picked, and there's another bunch of, like, unfold and wide groups. So emit um, describes the emission of values where there are no effects involved. So this thing is going to do one, and then two, and then three. Uh, eval, on the other hand, is going to do what we call embedding and like an F into the stream. 
So when we said, you know, emits things by requesting effects, this is what I mean. So we've got this IO, then we're run, we'll print line, hello, and we'll say, well, create a stream that we're run, will evaluate that IO and emit the result in that IO. Here I've got a random one, uh, and the only, no, so if you wonder what it does, it just does the allow repeatedly, so this is gonna, if you run it, it's gonna print line away forever. And the only reason I include this is because it's a sample of an infinite stream. I will see why this might make sense to, to have instead. So this is how you create a stream, and you've got this stream, and very, very much, stream is a data structure, right? So once you're passing them around, nothing's happening, just like with IO. So how do you make things happen? Like at some point, you need to, to make things happen. Uh, you do it by compiling it down to IO. So you've got you know, this stream of, of, of A's, F, uh, IO of A, and then you say, well, compile A gives an IO of unit, which describes the act of running the stream. And I'm assuming that all the values have been accounted for in some way. Either they've been used for other streams or they've been written somewhere. And this is like the final thing. And now that you've got this IO, okay, again, nothing is happening yet, because it's an IO, you can either compose it with other IOs, or if your IOs don't come from FS2, uh, or it's like your final thing, if everything is in stream. And then at the very end of the world, you say, well, this is the main action, unsafe for unsynchronously, and this is actually when side effects happen. But as I said before, since it's the last thing in your code chain, nothing can see that. And actually, the reason why Haskell is pure is because this one is in the runtime system, so it's outside of your language, so you can never, uh, it's got like, you know, discipline and things like um, So this is how to create and run streams. Now let's look a little bit about how to combine these streams together. And there's a focus, if you're familiar with Akka streams, FS2 is very different. Akka streams has got this focus on, on graphs, so like you draw these graphs and then like stream values through them. FS2 is just like, you have this stream, and stream is a first class entity. It's got instances it's like a, a, a monad or a monoid and several other things, and you just write things on, on stream, they're internally streams, and everything uh, you know, works that way. So the intuition I want to give you for how the stream behaves, imagine like it's kind of a list with superpowers. And the superpowers of the list are the fact that it's lazy, so it doesn't emit everything at once, the fact that it can be infinite, and the fact that it can embed effects into it. A normal list cannot embed effects unless you do side effects, but then you lose all the properties I talked about before. So an example is uh, like a pen. So if I got this code, it's a list code, very simple. Range one to 100, uh, produce three, and it looks a bit weird in, with, with lists. But, um, and then I append 21, 22, and this is the result. So when I do the same with stream, I've got this thing, but, and you're gonna see it throughout, throughout the talk, it's like a purely functional print line, basically. Uh, nothing more weird than that. And now I'm repeated by like this, this, this code. And so if you look at strictly the bottom isolation, it's like this infinite, infinite stream or hello, hello, hello. But then you take three. And just as take three on a list takes the first three elements, take three on a stream only requests emission of the first three elements. So in practice, only uh, produces the effect three times. So you're just printing hello three times. And then this is append, like does this list and then the other list. For a stream means execute the stream to completion and then start doing the other screen. So a very, very simple model. And again, the question like, yeah, what if this is infinite? Well, then, then we'll never execute. Uh, but in this case, it's fine because we take it. So monoidal append in a stream context means do this and then do that. Uh, a very, very simple model. So another way in which a, list, uh, a stream can be seen as a you know, more powerful list is flat map. So if you're familiar with the mono distance for list, it's literally just like, takes each element and produces a list out of the element with the function you pass in, and then appends all together. Uh, and the stream is the same. So I've got a stream of one to three, so this is like we'll produce one, and after producing one, we will call this function that will produce another stream. And in this case, I'm just stopping duplicating. Uh, I'm just printing the number twice. But you can obviously see an arbitrary stream. And then it's going to do that for each element, and then it's going to append the results. And how is it appended? Well, with the plus plus already we just see. So um, it's a sequential kind of thing. There's no, again, the reactive mm, stuff has got all the weird concurrency uh, out of the box. We have a very simple model, and then we build concurrency on top of it. So very simple. If it's one, uh, one gets printed twice, then it will need two, and two gets printed twice, and then. So again, 
super simple. If you're familiar with how this uh, flat map works, this is how stream uh, flat map works. And the final one on, on this section is a bit more interesting, is uh, zip. So let's see, uh, I've got a list of one to three. I want to zip in with a list of ABC. And I get one A to B to C. What does zipping mean for streams? So let's discuss this one by line. Again, fully functional free, right? And what I'm doing here, I'm creating a stream that will be one to 10, and then basically creating each other. The val map is just a, it's not a primitive, it's just a little combinator of a flat map when you want to produce an IO, another stream in the inside function. But just literally, there's like for each, pretty much. So for each element, just just read. Okay. And bear in mind, it's all print as fast as possible. It's like, you know, one to ten as fast as possible. Uh, this other stream here is another way of producing a stream. And what, we, what this will do, it will emit a tick on that duration. So you've got this stream here that prints uh, one to ten very fast, and you've got this other stream going like this. So just like zipping this means sort of forcing element together parallels. With streams, it means making sure that the two elements are emitted in sync, because you need to produce a tool, right? And so in that case, what this will do, it will force the fast stream to go as fast as the slow stream, right? Because they didn't want to go, but it needs to wait for the other side, because it needs a tool, until you get the first. And then it wants to go fast, but it needs to wait for the other side, because it wants to tool, and so on. So what you get is one, two, three, four, one per second. And this is extremely compositional. Like imagine doing the same thing on a loop. In the loop, you need to do at both the logic to print and the logic to wait. You cannot separate these two. You can maybe pass a function for like the logic, but you still haven't separated the execution of the thing and the, 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 the time of the but in this case, I've got this independent like streams, like this fast one that does one bit of the behavior and the time one, and zipping puts them puts them back together. So I think this is like a good place. Uh, uh, obviously, there's a million more combinators that I cannot touch, but this is like I think it gives you an idea of the philosophy behind FS2. It's just a very simple and powerful abstraction. Uh, you know, it's a lot less machinery to do stuff, in my opinion, than the other streams. Uh, and other streaming libraries. Um, I wanna wanna say now is a very simple example. I'm gonna run through this quickly uh, because I'm running out of time very fast. So I don't know if I've got the time because I've got more interesting stuff than this. Um, yeah, but basically, very simple use case. Uh, I've got um, health check API, and I want to call that check API kind of every hour to make sure something is up. But when I get a call, I don't wanna fail and say, okay, this thing is down if the, the call fails. I want to first retry a certain number of times with video back off. And then if I still fail, then I say, okay, it's down. If not, it's fine. And I want to do this whole thing every hour. So I'm going to run through this quickly. You've got the stream and try combinator. It takes an IO action, which in this case is the HTTP call. It takes the initial uh, you know, interval one second, and it takes a function from duration to duration. So I'm increasing by one, sort of linear back off in this very uh, plus one. Slow, and I say max <coughs> retries. So max retries means if you have tried like too many times, then the thing is going to fail. Uh, so I've got a stream that will either produce, uh, uh, either produce the result of each call or fail after five times. So either way, so this next thing here is like my own time. It's not like a stream. It's like your application time. I'm going to say, well, map the constructor of that check message or the result. So if the result is there, it will be it up, and when there's an error, just emit error messages. So it doesn't fail now, uh, it will just emit another thing. And again, when I say error, we don't have a true exceptions or anything like that, it's all encapsulated just like you see with IO or even with your future enterprise, just component. And now I've got all this logic, which is independent, again, very compositional. I want to do it every hour. And the way I do it, very simple, I do check, and then after checking, I want to sleep for an hour, and then I'm going to repeat. Just like that. And I've got this infinite stream that describes my behavior. And again, we will talk a little bit about sleep and why it's not the same thing as stress uh, in, in the next sequence. And again, I just return the infinite stream because later on I can say take the first five, I can say zip it, I can do whatever I want. Uh, 
But again, this is complicated logic. I think in my experience, every project that's got this thing will be implemented at some point. Uh, so again, very, very simple example of the class control flow. The same properties of our simple <coughs> list thing at the very beginning, every line can make sense and so on. And they put back together and they also make sense. The result makes sense. So declarative control flow. Uh, my recipe is like you can just create a very simple single action scenario. And then you use stream to kind of assemble them and weave them together and to, to build this complicated, complicated control flow. And this is high level, you know, just map, filter, take while, you know, zip. Uh, it's declarative, in my opinion, and it's composable. And composable is not my opinion, it's, it's actually composable because of preferential transparency and all, and all this. Um, so the sort of catchphrase for this, I like to think of IOs as my words and streams as my sentences. So you can do this with IO only, without stream, just by using four comprehensions. Just like you can build a sentence when you think, thinking through word by word, but when you, you know, you don't think in words most of the time, you think in sentences, and it's the same effect in my opinion. Like it's, it's, a, it's a much more high level way of, of building things. So, concurrency. First of all, I'm going to tell you a bit about the concurrency features of FS2, and what I mean by stream concurrency and why uh, it matters. So, stream concurrency. All I mean by that is we have the ability of creating a stream which runs by interleaving several streams non deterministically So, you have four or five streams, and you want to get a stream that will do all of them in a concurrent manner, non deterministically Obviously, once you start doing that, you start having the need to coordinate between this concurrent stuff. So we have combinators for, for that, and we also have data structures. We have queues, semaphores, signals, uh, and, and so on. You want to run on thread pools. So just because you're running 10 streams doesn't mean you want to run 10 threads. Threads are a scarce resource on the JVM. You want to be able to have a thread pool, I don't know, five threads, 10 threads, 100 threads, or in JS, one thread, and still be able to run streams, and we do that. Non-blocking, same reason. Uh, when you block on a JVM by a blocking method or a thread sleep or something, there's now a thread that cannot be used by any other stuff until you finish blocking. It's not good. You're going to starve eventually if you do this. So all of our concurrency is implemented with block free data structures and it's not blocking. So even when you say a queue reading from an empty queue in FS2 blocks, it's not blocking a thread. The stream doesn't proceed, but the thread is free for other streams to run on. So this is scale a lot better than you know, the typical Java one thread per request blocking, blocking stuff. And finally, this is resource safe. This is super important. It's probably the hardest bit in the implementation. So you're opening resources with streams, maybe files or maybe you know, sockets or whatever, and you're building this complicated concurrent you know, with streams. You want to make sure that if uh, everything successfully terminates, the resource are closed. And if something fails, something fails the resource are also closed. Regardless of how much concurrency you've got that. And this is guaranteed for you by FS2. You don't do zero work. Just create a stream with bracket saying, this is the way you open the resource, and this is the way you close the resource, and everything else is struct, struct for you. So, why does, does concurrency uh, matter for, for streaming? So, if you look at the way I describe stream as this control flow thing, you can look at it as a kind of logical thread of execution. So, a Java thread is like, you know, this sort of physical thread with a sequence of operations. You can look at a stream as a logical thread, which is nicer because you have functions that operate in the thread itself, like take while or zip. And logically, once you have this thing, oh, I've got this thread of execution, you want to have more than one thread of execution, right, to do complicated things. So by interleaving logical threads, you can build complex behavior. And so interleaving logical threads corresponds to stream concurrency, basically. And it's still the card again composable, even when con concurrency is involved. One of the things by combinators and, and uh, keep these nice composition properties. And I claim that this is pure FP for the real world. So people say that functional programming is good if you want to run small, non effectful algorithms. But then when you go into databases and sockets, you have to do stuff, you know, imperative, that's the way it works. But I shouldn't say it's the opposite. If anything, it's fine to run a small computation as a pure while loop, like, you know, a simple list to list thing, if you need performance. But when this stuff, start happening, databases, sockets, then I want my reasoning with you to help me out. And this is why FP is nice. This is why it keeps you. Oh, uh, I'm almost done. I've got very so simple code examples of how you do this. So imagine this is the same application. I've got the L check, and again, remember, it's a stream of messages, up, down, up, down. I've got another stream, 
Kafka messages. I'm reading stuff from Kafka. And again, this can be arbitrarily complicated. This scenario it might read from a database, go to Kafka, do some logic, send this request. But for me at this point, it's just another script by your message. And then I got my old nice Celsius conversion there. That is still, I want to run in the background while I do this other stuff for some reason. And this is a stream I know you, so it's going to be do it all the time because you don't care about this. And now, and this is like people get confused, like, okay, I've already put all this together, I've got several streams, and now I need to somehow tell my application, okay, run, run them all. So we have a combinator called uh, join, or in this case, join and bundle. And I'm not going to do, discuss bundle and bundle in this case. But the first step is I want to create a stream of streams. Just like a list of lists. Difference being that you know when I make the streams and the stream itself are repeat. And then join goes from stream IO, stream IO A to stream IO A. So it's kind of like flatten, except flatten works sequentially by running this one and then this one and then this one. Whereas join um, works concurrently. So we'll do get this one, this one, this one, this one, into loops, just like a scheduler uh, would in the real brain. And notice this data there. So what Drain does, uh, so this is not compiled, right? Because you call message message unit. Just like if you try and create a list of lists, with like list of in, list of in, then list of unit, it won't compile. I mean, it won't list of any whatever. But it shouldn't compile. Uh, so what I want to say, from a type system perspective, I want to make this compile. So the type of Drain goes from stream your unit to stream your nothing. This nothing is a subtype of everything, not everything compiles. So this is the type system. But the logical view is, I only care about this stream for its effect. I don't care about the emitted values. So I want to create a stream that will do things, but never emit anything. So because this conversion needs to happen, I want it to happen, but I don't care about the emission of units. I care about the emission of messages. So this is like a behavior view and type view. And I've got the stream, and then when you join them, things are going to happen, uh, are going to happen concurrently. And again, this is another stream. So now I've got the other stream, and from my point of view, this is just another stream. It doesn't matter that now things are happening concurrently. Flat map. Uh, if there's an error, it's going to get interrupted. If things are, if this one is interrupted, the other stream is going to get, you know, it's all and resources are tracked for you, so everything, everything works. Uh, you don't have to do any other, uh, not to build any other machine on top of this. So final example, um, and this is like I want to guide you to building a concurrent combinator. So what I want to do, I want to take uh, this function that takes a stream, a stream, and then interrupt this stream after a certain time uh, as it's passed. And let's do it step by step. So first of all, the first thing is this interrupt when combinator, and this will do the actual, the actual interruption. Um, and this is like in, in the libraries. It's, it's not primitive, but it's complicated to, to implement. Um, and I'm passing that signal there. So what is signal? So signal is one of those concurrent data structures that I mentioned. And the easiest way to think about it, imagine like you're tracking the speed of a car. And it goes like this. So a signal is a data structure that tracks changes of um, purely functional mutable variable, pretty much. So yeah, again, imagine any, any kind of like monitor with a thing going like that, that's it. Uh, and in this case, I just want a simple switch. So I'm just going to go like on and off, true and false. And so interrupt when it takes the signal, because once the signal gets switched on, it will interrupt the stream. And if not, it won't do anything. Now I'm going to create a completely different stream. There's no, nothing about, about it. Again, we'll take the stream, the signal as input, and we'll sleep for a duration f. I don't know why I call duration f. I think I changed the code at some point. Uh, it's making sense. For a duration f. Um, and again, this sleep there is not sleeping a trait. So it's still non blocking. It's just sleeping the stream. And after that, using concatenation, it will just set the signal to true. So the signal is pure. So set returns an I.O. of unit, doesn't do side effects, and so you need a vowel to embed into the stream, just like I told you. And the other interesting bit is this fact that they need to be passed as an argument. So the, the way functional, purely functional mutable state works, everything is in I.O. and creation is in I.O. So if you refer to the same name twice, two things get created. This is nice. Again, local reasoning. I cannot refer to several things, and they are sharing state. So how do I actually share state? I just pass things as arguments, and then I create them once. Let's see how. Again, I use a signal off. Signal off creates a signal with the initial value. In this case, it's false. And again, it returns I.O. So I need to evolve the I.O. to make it the screen. And when I flat map, I get the signal. And now I can just pass 
the signal to burn out and stop. So out and stop are now sharing this, uh, this switch. You've got this switch. Then one is going to sleep and then set it to true, and the other one is programmed to stop as soon as this thing is set to true. Uh, and again, nice and compositional, you know, we're building this complicated game. But now, how do we do runner and stopper? So we cannot do one after the other, right? If we do run and the stopper, there's no way the thing is going to get stopped because to, to execute stopper is to wait for runner to finish, which defies the purpose. And if I do stopper first, same thing. It's going to sleep and then you're going to set it to, to true and then the thing is never going to execute because it's been interrupted. So we could just join, but we actually have a more specific combinator for this specific case where you only care about one side and you want to run a concurrent thing on, 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 you know, on the side, so to speak. Because, you know, that stopper, we don't care about it. We just want it to, to do stuff. And it's called concurrently, unsurprisingly. So we do runner, and concurrently we run stopper. So this runner is, is running, and we start this thing, and we sleep, and then we'll set the switch to true, and uh, the screen is aware of, of the, the switch, and it's going to get interrupted. And what I did there is just some blind refactoring, just inlining the substitution, and I can always inline because of QFP. I can always change. Uh, so I, I carry the, the stream to stream thing, and I'll show you why in a second. Uh, I make uh, and I inline the, the, the runner just to see that. So I you know, create a signal, and then in, interrupt when end, then concurrently close, close with it. Um, so how do I use it? So again, I thought this seemingly nonsensical infinite stream repeated about of print line alone, and it's running forever. I want to run it for two seconds. So through that, it's a very simple function that takes a stream to stream and applies it. So it's literally, you could say, you cannot you could not use this, and just do stop after on this thing. It's just for syntax, scala likes, or O style, you know, a dot b dot c, so that it's nothing more than that. It's just literally reverse function application. So you've got this nice, and I, I think if I tell a random person to tell me what this does, even though it's using a lot of machinery and pure FP, this is still nice. Repeat the value of print value alone. They would not do a value of that. And then stop after two seconds. And so what happens when you run this uh, is that you, you know, print a low, 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 low for two seconds, and, and that's stop. So complicated concurrent behavior, still in a nice compositional manner. Every line makes sense on its own, and it's still referentially transparent, no side effects anyway. And so go wild. <clears throat> so I've used this to build a bunch, a bunch of stuff, for open source and closed source, caches, ring images, um, or just use it for your normal control flow of, of things. Because you know the streaming aspect is very interesting and it's very useful. I do use it. But depending on what you do, you might not need the, the streaming all the time. And actually, in this company, maybe you do. But you definitely, not everyone needs the streaming aspect. But you do need control flow every day, like regardless of what you do. And this is a nice way of, of, of doing control flow. So FS2 uh, is very good for data that is too big to fit in memory. And it's also very good for control flow that's hard to fit in one set. Because of so yeah, questions? I'm not on Twitter, so it's pointless to. Like at me, and there's another guy that never tweets with my name. But I'm on GitHub, um, very friendly, so in chat. And then obviously, thanks to my, uh, the other two core contributors, Michael Pickers, Project Donut, and Paolo Rupiasek. So thank you. <laughs> oh, and you can ask questions here. Yeah. I've always wondered, I never. Checks it myself. Uh, some of some of the uh, functions on streams are actually suffix with underscore. Do you know what the reason? For yes. That? Yeah. It's just a convention. Um, yes. It's basically sometimes you end up uh, wanting something they do and then drain. Uh, like sleep will produce unit. Will sleep and produce unit. And then every time you want to do sleep and then do something, it will do stream f unit plus stream fa. So you need to do stream sleep dot drain. So underscore just means something that drains. Every time it's nothing, so you can just leap. And, and the same with, with, with eval. And like they all, underscore in FS2 means drained, and it turns nothing. I think that's actually a classical invention as well. Um, so you see that in sort of the Java and the same kind of So it's similar. In Haskell, it means unit, actually. So you've got yeah. something that returns an A, like uh, map n or sequence. And this is the one using cats as well, so sequence return. Uh, you've got, you know, um, f of g of a when g of fa, but 
But if you just want to see ones that are never written to your unit, then see ones on the score. So it's slightly different for us. But yeah, it's a, it's a convention of discarding when you don't see ones on the score. Yeah. Yeah, when I was trying to run that uh, sample when I was watching this talk online. Yeah, it doesn't compile now. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that, so the reason for this is like, so that's the, that is now stream now. Uh, and Agoi Cavalry is also now stream. The reason we it was on scheduler, we were uh, uh, you know, a scheduler, non blocking scheduler that we have built. And as part of this latest Cat Effect version, we have migrated some features from FS2 to Cat Effect. So now we got both scheduler in FS2, which contains sleep, and timer in Cat Effect. So we're going to deprecate scheduler, and sleep is going to be a stream. So since it's, it's, I need to create a scheduler, it's shorter on the slide like that. I cheat a bit, and it's like on a branch, it's not, it's not released. But you can write it with scheduler, I can like, you know, show you that. Is there another question? Yeah. 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 Like they did libraries, so if you do things like JMI or manually memory manage, yeah. like libraries, like stream are very good way of doing resources in terms of uh, like non-JVM managed resources, like memory in, like say, Hopsuite, for example. No, it's that's an, I never thought about that use case. Sounds very interesting. But yeah, resource safety is, is, is big. Uh, it's also the hardest bit to get to get right. It's, it's big crazy. Uh, any other questions? Cool. Thank you very much for having me.